Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you, Tim, for that session. That was just so on point. And uh, Rick, the name is actually Mureu. You roll the R's like a Scotsman, okay? <laughs> and it means a drunkard, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I also want to say thank you to Matt for the session you had. That was really brilliant. I want to hear that again and listen through it again. Hey, I'm, I'm supposed to uh, speak on um, the, leaders, the leader's challenge, greatest challenge, if I may put it that way. And I'm so excited about that because I really, really, through my years of ministry as a pastor, 30 years at the Nairobi Chapel, really do believe towards the end of my time, I, I began to figure out what the leader's greatest challenge is. And uh, I went to the Nairobi Chapel as a rookie out of uh, theological college, Bible school. I had just finished my undergraduate in zoology when I accepted the Lord as my savior and went straight to school. Three years later, as a three and a half year old Christian, I was sent to this little Plymouth Brethren Church that had 10 people on a good Sunday and four on a bad Sunday. And I was asked to revitalize our congregation and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how hard it is. I knew nothing about leading a small congregation. I just went in with the zeal of youth and with passion. I wanted to change the world for Christ. And man, it was rough. I wish you had shared your message with me at the time I was going in 30 years ago. I had no leadership experience. I'd never led anything significant. I'd never read a book on leadership and I'd done no courses on how to lead organizations and how to lead teams. I was raw and eager and keen. But I had a real passion for Jesus. And I think God showed up. Maybe he just felt, oh dear, this young man, what will I do with him? And let me just help him. And God showed up and amazing things began to happen. Three years as we, after we began, the church had grown to about 500 people. But as we continued to grow, I quickly realized I was in trouble because my personal capacity was not going to keep us growing numerically. My limited capacity to preach every Sunday, to conduct weddings and funerals, to manage growth, to shepherd and be available to people in need, to lead an organization, and the hundred other things that a lead pastor does. And at this point, I was alone. I had no help. I was tired, I was overwhelmed, I was discouraged that I couldn't keep up with the unending demands. I was struggling with borderline burnout. I cried out to the Lord for help. I felt my marriage was on the rocks. And God answered and gave me a conviction from a passage in scripture. Today, the Nairobi Chapel has planted about 250 churches, many of them in Kenya, churches in 10 different African nations. We're trying to plant a church in every capital city of Africa. And we have five churches off the continent of Africa. We're trying to plant in the gateway cities like Sydney, London, San Francisco. Just started in San Francisco three months ago, Dubai, Berlin, Toronto, Canada, Delhi, um, Hong Kong, Shanghai. These are the places that we feel led by the Lord to go and plant churches. Not for the Kenyan diaspora, not for Africans in those countries, but for the peoples of those countries. And the verse that the Lord gave me is what I want to share with you today because it's been a leading conviction on my heart through the years. It was simply Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. And in it, the Lord said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would send out more laborers into his harvest field. And there are three things that I have sought to build my ministry around. And the first of them is this. As I travel the world and hear people talking about the state of the church, the spread of Christianity in the 1040 window, in Arabia, in Europe, in Canada, here in the US, everyone is talking about the decline of the church in the Northern Hemisphere and how hard it is to root the church down, particularly in the 1040 window. 
We'd say that people are not ready for the God conversation in the Northern Hemisphere. They're not ready for that conversation anymore. The liberalism and the secularism has marginalized Christians and the message of the gospel. We are not popular anymore. We're not in the public square and the church is in decline. May I suggest to you that that is wrong? We even talk about cultures in the Northern Hemisphere. New Zealand, it's not in the North, but it's considered part of the Northern Hemisphere. England, Canada, for example, we call these states post-Christian nations. It's a human categorization because I don't think God has that word post-Christian in his vocabulary. What do you mean by post-Christian? Are you saying that God cannot reach you because you're post-Christian? I don't think he has that word in his vocabulary. You see, I call this the scarcity mentality of the church. We say that the harvest is little, it's dried up, we're in a secularized desert, nobody's ready for the gospel anymore, but that's our perspective. Because God looks at the same situation and he says in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, the harvest is plentiful. You see, every day God hears the cry of the many lonely, desperate people around the world who are crying for hope, praying, if there is a God in heaven, Please, please, please reveal yourself to me today or I will commit suicide. Give me hope, Lord. I'm desperate. Hundreds of millions of people around the world crying for God to somehow give them a breakthrough. They may say that they don't believe in a God in heaven, but when push comes to shove, they cry out to the God of heaven, crying for transformation praying for forgiveness. And God hears the cry of that single mother, that dying patient, that drug addict, that helpless teenager, that father whose family is in danger because they're in a war-torn country. And he sees their hearts are ready. To God, the harvest in this country of America is abundant and plentiful, and the harvest in New Zealand is abundant. Australia in 1999 was, was said to be the second most secular country in the world, continent in the world, but God looks and he can see the hundreds of thousands who are crying for help, and he says the harvest in Australia is abundant. You see, God has an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality about the world. What about you? What do you have about your community? Did you know right now that the country of Iran, that we think is unreachable, difficult access country, actually about three weeks ago, Iran was rated to be the world's fastest growing church in a country today. Iran. And so this is the first, that the Lord helped me to begin to let go of that scarcity mentality and to take on an abundance mentality. Doesn't matter whether we're in Sydney or in Toronto or we're in San Francisco, the harvest is abundant. Just open my eyes, Lord, and help me see what I cannot see with my eyes. Like the prophet's servant in Dotham where the prophet prayed, open his eyes, and he opened his eyes. God opened the, pro the servant's eyes, and he saw the fiery chariots surrounding the city. And the little puny Aramean, you know, army that had come to capture them was nothing in comparison with God's heavenly hosts. Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see this abundant harvest. But here's the second thing. The problem is not the harvest. The problem is that the laborers are few. That's where the problem is. And this is why we're not winning. The harvest is quite fine. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. Jesus even said that the fields are ripe for harvest. The problem 
is that there are not enough laborers. And you see, guys, if you do not solve the problem of laborers, you will not solve the problem of the harvest. There are not enough harvesters, not enough leaders to get the work done. This is the greatest leadership challenge that we face. It's at the heart of everything we do, and we are doomed to fail if we do not address it first and fast. You're doomed to burn out, to leave a meager, insignificant legacy behind if you do not solve the problem of the laborers for ministry. Picture with me a farmer going out into his harvest field. He has a thousand acres of ripe wheat to harvest and bring into the barns. But he has only two farm hands and himself. He can work as fast as he knows how to work. He can work smarter and not harder. He can go to the classes to teach him how to be more efficient. He can go for meetings that will help him strategize. He can do together, you know, a strategic plan on how to bring in a thousand acres of harvest. But if he does not solve the labor problem, he will not bring in the harvest for all the degrees and meetings and conferences and places that he goes for ideas. The more harvesters we commission to the mission field or to the harvest field, the greater the harvest will be. The fewer the harvesters, the smaller the harvest will be. The size of your harvest depends on how many leaders you raise up. And so the question is, what are you doing right now to multiply your leadership base? Because if you're not, then your harvest will be limited to your personal capacity. You are the bottleneck that will limit the harvest that God can bring your way. So central is this thought that Jesus' own strategy when he came on earth is he didn't do what I would have done. I would have gone and bought the biggest PA system I can get, huge speakers, screens as big as these, and I would have put them up in the public square and invited a great crowd, maybe had some showstoppers before I come up to, you know, preach a message, and I would have tried to lead as many people to Christ as possible. He doesn't do that. Jesus begins, in fact, the most significant part of his, his strategy and his work he begins by finding 12 leaders and he invests the greater bulk of his time and ministry in these 12. And after three years, he says, it is finished. I'm done. I'm ready to go because these 12 are ready. Our strategy is to throw ourselves into the work at the expense of training leaders. We're so busy running around trying to do everything, organize things, we're tired, we're worn out, we're burning out our families, it's hurting us, we're, we're in poor health, but we can't stop because the work is growing and the demands are increasing. Not Jesus, it's the 12, and that's where he begins. So let me suggest this. A sign of great leadership is not the size of your congregation. Truly the sign of great leadership is how many leaders you're raising up wherever God has positioned you. If it's in youth ministry, if it's in a rural church, wherever God has positioned you, how many leaders are you raising up? It was this passage in scripture that caused us to change the way we were doing ministry. Out of it came a leadership development process that we call the leadership pipeline. And in the last 20 years, over 2,000 young men and women have gone through that pipeline. And so we're sending out missionaries to New Zealand, to other countries in the world, to the UK, planting churches around Africa through these young people. It's through this that we learned how to find potential leaders in abundance. It was through this that we learned how to call them into ministry. 
And I'll be talking about this in the breakout in the afternoon. It was through this that we learned how to grow them, what we call the leadership pipeline itself, and how to build grit and resilience in them so that they're ready to go to the difficult places of the world. We even talk about the six stages of development that we need to take our young leaders to get them ready to launch out around the world. This is the second thing. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Solve the labor problem before you start bringing in the harvest. And then the third is Jesus tells us how to resolve this. He says, pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would bring his laborers into the harvest field. You want to solve the labor problem? It begins on your knees. So let me tell you one way that we try to do this, and I'll close on this. One year, we sat down, you know, the children's pastor, the youth pastor, myself, you know, and several others, because we're a big church, and we have a multiple staff. We sat down around a board table, and we said, each of you pull out a piece of paper, and I want you to write on that piece of paper who you think in your sphere of influence, in your ministry, among your friends, that God might be calling into ministry. Because you know what? The Bible says that God never does anything without first revealing it to his prophets. That's you and I. And so God, I think you have been showing us, but we're not paying attention. So let's take a piece of paper and you write down. And one of the people on that paper was, I wrote down, I, have a, I had a seven-year-old niece who had said, when I grow up, I want to be like my uncle, Pastor Oscar. I want to be a pastor. I did not take that lightly. I wrote down their name. And different people wrote down, you know, among the children, among the youth, etc., etc. And we had a list of about 65 people on that paper, on those papers. And we said, okay, guys, let's go and pray for each one of these people by name for the next one month. Set aside consistent, disciplined time to pray and ask God, Lord, if you're calling, make it clear. If you're not calling, call them. I believe in the best for the Lord. And so you're the, you know, you're the geek in the church who's coming up with these wonderful things. You need to be in ministry. You know, you're heading for a medical career. You need to be in ministry. Why should I accept just the dregs of society to come into pastoral ministry? I want the best. 65 people. We prayed about it for a month. And after a month, we said, let's go and talk with them, have a cup of coffee and say, have you ever thought about ministry? Because when we've been praying as pastors, your name has been one of the things that God has set on our hearts. And we're not pressuring you to go down that road. You know, the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and they follow after me. And so if what I'm saying is what God is saying to you, it's going to resonate with something inside you because you know the voice of God. And don't listen to me. Go back and talk to God about this. And let's meet again in a week or two's time and tell me what you think. And if it is, then I will help you take the next steps, open doors for you so that you can go where it is that God is calling you. And if it's not, let's have a good laugh and go have a meal and say, ha, you know, I thought you'd make a minister. Can you imagine? You of all people. <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. 65 people on that piece of paper, 48 of them confirmed that God had been calling them. When I was a child, I just knew, but I've drowned out that voice. When I was in high school, I sensed God wanted me to be an evangelist, but I never took it seriously. In the last couple of months, I've been having this inkling that God wants me in ministry. I haven't known what to do with it. 48 of 65 confirmed that God was calling them. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray. This, I believe, is a leader's greatest challenge. Raise up laborers for the work of the kingdom. God bless you.